New topic. Uh, we are, I don't want to say that we're done with um, plug flow reactors. It's, it's not like we're going to be done with them in the sense that, you know, we're never going to look at them again. Oh, look at my lower camera. It's a little bit off. There we go. Um, but we're done with them in the sense that we probably will not uh, particularly look at them during class anymore. We're going to move to um, different topics in class. Uh, uh, we're down to two reactors remaining. One of the reactors, the ones that we're going to look at um, today, uh, looks pretty much like. Uh, sorry, I got to hold. I got to find uh, John over here in the chat. Um, it looks pretty much like a PFR. Um, it will look a lot like a PFR when we go to solve it. It will look a lot like a PFR when we go to set these things up. It'll look a lot like a PFR when we are um, looking at problem statements, right? The types of information that'll come up will look a lot like a PFR. Um, it's, it's just not quite a PFR. It's, it's very, very similar to it. Um, but that's also one of the nice things, right? Because all of the same uh, tools and things that we use for PFRs, uh, we can also use for these uh, new uh, types of um, reactors. So we're going to switch topics onto um, these new reactors today. Uh, just a, a follow up in terms of like where we are in terms of uh, scheduling and stuff. We've kind of bumped back a few homeworks um, and we're going to make up that time here on the pack bed reactors. Um, so normally we would have something like uh, I think 10 days or more to work on the pack bed reactor homework. Um, that's going to get cut down. It'll still be due at its regular time. It'll probably get posted like tomorrow or something like that. Um, but there will just be far fewer questions in it. So I'm, I'm aiming for probably like three questions, four, maybe something like that. Um, and not like that classic, you know, engineering type homework where it's like, oh yeah, question one's part A, B, C, D, E, stuff like that. Um, three or four fairly straightforward um, pack bed reactor type problems, um, just so that you can get kind of the hang of it. And then we'll, we'll keep looking at it for some special cases, but there aren't that many special cases for these, these new reactors. Um, and then with that, we're on to basically our last topic. Um, after this particular reactor, we look at batch reactors. Um, and we look at batch reactors because we use those as a way of determining all these rate laws that we've been using. Um, so, we're getting there. We're, we're over the hump. Um, we're on the, the easier side now. Um, also, just a note for today's lecture, we're still going to have FICA around like 2.45, something like that. I don't have my little uh, teapot for today, so I'm just going to have to microwave some water to make some tea. But that's how it goes. So our um, new topic for today, we are going to start looking at what's called a packed bed reactor. And I want to spend a little bit of time, probably the majority of this first lecture period, um, just looking at some of the terminology that's associated with a packed bed reactor. Um, because I think part of the difficulty with, with new reactors is if you go look for information on them, they use different terminology, right? They, they have new variables that are all, I mean, at their, their core, they're fairly simple to define, but when you're just learning a, a new field, it, it can be kind of overwhelming to get all of this new um, information. Uh, before we do an actual packed bed reactor, um, what I want to look at is uh, the reason why we would use a packed bed reactor is because we need to use a catalyst. Um, so let's take a look at some of the features of catalysts. So there are a few reactions that you can do um, which don't require a catalyst. So things like uh, thermal cracking where you just take a, like a long chain hydrocarbon or something and you just really heat it up. You don't burn it, you just get it really hot. Um, and if it gets really hot, eventually it'll fall apart. Um, and so you can generate you know, hydrogen, you can um, break down waste and, and turn it into, we actually saw an example of that, of, of syngas, of, something that we can then use to, to generate, you know, a fuel or a plastic or, or, or something like that. Um, but I would say the a large number of industrially relevant um, reactions and, and more importantly, a large number of uh, important bioreactions rely on catalysts. Um, and virtually every reaction on a, in a biosystem relies on a catalyst of some kind. Um, and so the, the key idea of a, a catalyst that you probably remember from 
um, a chemistry course uh, is it lowers the activation energy uh, compared to the uncatalyzed uh, reaction. Uh, and so the, a common plot that you will see of what do we mean by um, lower the activation energy is people will draw these plots where on the x-axis is this sort of vaguely defined concept of a reaction coordinate. Um, and then on the y-axis is energy. Uh, and if you start off with products here and reactants over here, or sorry, if you end up with products over here and reactants over here, you have to go through this energy barrier. That's our activation energy. This would be the catalyzed version. Um, if there were an uncatalyzed reaction, that reaction still happens. It's just very, very improbable um, under a lot of circumstances. And so the uncatalyzed reaction might have a much higher activation energy um, than the, the catalyzed reaction. It doesn't change um, the reactants that you started with, nor the products that you end up with, right? It, it only changes what we call the activation energy, which is related to the probability that that reaction will occur. But that's really important. Um, often the things that we are trying to catalyze don't really happen to any appreciable rate under normal circumstances. Um, so that it, that's not nothing um, to lower an activation energy like that. It, it can make it basically happen or not happen. Um, Oftentimes, the catalysts that we're interested in um, are nano-sized. And they're very often some sort of a precious metal. Uh, and so the precious metals that we often deal with are things like um, platinum, palladium, that sort of stuff, gold. Um, and then they're deposited Um, onto a, a porous structure, um, which I'm just going to assume is a porous ceramic. Um, the idea of the, the support that you put it on is um, that it doesn't interact, right? It's just there to hold up the precious metal. Um, so things like alumina um, are standard Al2O3. That's a, a common one. Um, just straight carbon is fine. It's not really a ceramic, um, but straight carbon is another common one. Um, if you're interested in fuel cells at all, carbon is a very common substrate for um, fuel cells. And then they, for a fuel cell, they typically will put like either a platinum or a palladium on top of that um, carbon. Um, an in important, boy, what makes something a ceramic? Good question. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a clear definition of exactly what is a ceramic. That's that's a good question, but I don't have a just a flat answer for it. What are examples of catalysts that aren't precious metals? Biocatalysts, proteins, um, but also for very large scale processes. And that's something I'm gonna mention here in a minute. An area of active research is how do we do this without precious metals? Um, and so some types of iron um, can be very useful as a, a precious metal if you can, or as a catalyst, if you can get it into the right crystal structure. Um, something that chemists and material scientists and chemists all work together on. Um, a key feature of uh, anything that uses a, uh, a catalyst, or a catalyst or plural catalyst, um, they don't change um, equilibrium. So you can't you can't. You can never do better than equilibrium. You can do things like you know. There, maybe the the true state of equilibrium, if you have five different reactions, takes a million and a half years to get to it, and so you can get to, you know, a, a, the actual equilibrium process much faster with a catalyst that you couldn't otherwise get to with an uncatalyzed system, and so it, it can make it look as though it has gotten around equilibrium, uh, but it, it cannot do any better than equilibrium. So if you have the case of just one reaction occurring, if you catalyze that reaction, you cannot do better than equilibrium um, just because you've used a catalyst. All you can do is change the rate at which um, you get there. So the only thing that it can change uh, is the rate. So if you were to look at a, a plot, 
uh, and the volume of your reactor is out here. And I'm going to draw these little dashed lines to say like, okay, break that axis and let it go much, much further, like way out to some new value. Uh, that's right. KEQ does not change. The, the K, it, it, it doesn't change in the sense that it's still there, right? It, it's, it exists. Um, if we look at the conversion of something and we calculate the equilibrium conversion of, I'm going to use the example of just a single reaction, um, under normal circumstances with an uncatalyzed reaction, maybe that conversion goes very small up till here. But then if you make the reactor big enough, right? If, if you make this thing, I don't know, circle the earth or something like that, right? Just an absolutely huge reactor, eventually you will come up here to equilibrium, right? If, if you make it big enough, if you give it enough time to react, you'll get there. The only thing that changes when you use a, a catalyst is that this process may happen much, much faster, but you're still approaching the same equilibrium point Right, and so the the conversion of A doesn't change um, by the time you reach that that equilibrium point. So this is what that might look like uh, if it were a catalyzed reaction, um, and then this one is uncatalyzed underneath it. So it it may look as though like well if if this volume out here is already the size of like the state of California, that's pretty big, right? And now if I use my um, catalyst and, and get to this point in the state of California, it looks like it has actually changed quite a bit, right? Because the composition coming out of a reactor the size of California now looks really different. And that's perfectly fine, right? That hopefully you do need a smaller reactor um, with a catalyst than an a non-catalyzed reaction. But that theoretical state of the equilibrium um, conversion or the equilibrium composi composition has not changed. It's still there. You just may have gotten to it or not. Um, I just wanted to backtrack a moment here. When we're talking about uh, nano-sized particles being deposited onto a ceramic, often the picture that we use is something like a, a spherical particle. Um, which a lot of times they, they are spherical, uh, but they do not need to be um, spheres. And then deposited on here, we just draw a couple of dots, right? And so these tiny little dots, those are the actual things that are the catalysts. So those are the precious metals. Um, but we often refer to this combination of both the substrate, so the ceramic or the carbon or whatever it is that the catalyst is set on, along with the actual little particles that we put on there, we kind of refer to this whole lumped thing um, as quote unquote the catalyst. It's not, right? It, the, the precious metal is the thing that's the catalyst, um, but it's just sort of a shorthand that we use. We don't really distinguish um, between the two of those. We're not going to, for example, distinguish between the two of them. As far as we're concerned, this is just gonna be one big particle um, that we're dealing with um, and whatever happens on there happens on there. The details of catalyst particles, um, if you're interested in like, what does that actually look like, right? The, the reaction, reactants have to sort of diffuse into this catalyst uh, or this particle deposit on the surface next to one of the, um, or on top of one of the precious metals and then react and then get off of the surface and get back out of the particle. Um, all of that is uh, a big part of what we do in grad 113 um, because it's, it's relevant, right? Whatever you're using it for, those processes are important. Um, but we don't get into them here. We just look at what is the uh, behavior of the reactor um, as opposed to the behavior of the, the catalyst itself. But it's a, a really neat topic um, to get into that level of detail. You have to start bringing in ideas of um, 101C, mass transport, um, because it's, it's molecules diffusing in pores and things like that. Um, so it, it's a, an interesting um, application of all of the main areas of um, chemical engineering. There is plenty of active research uh, in catalysis. Um, and one of them was the one that um, we had just mentioned a moment ago, which is sort of the, maybe the obvious one, which is uh, less expensive particles. 
um, but that goes along with uh, safer, right? It'd be nice if we didn't have to use precious metals um, that you know require more toxic processing in order to extract them from their ores in the earth. If we could just use iron instead of palladium or something like that, um, it's probably easier to get that iron or aluminum or, or whatever it is. Um, so finding less expensive and safer catalysts um, is is certainly a, a a way to go. Uh, related to that is um, a novel catalyst, right? One that's never been used before to catalyze a particular reaction. Um, that would be nice if, if we could do something like this. Um, all of these, by the way, I'm going to talk about the tools that we use to actually generate these in a moment um, because they are all related. Uh, all of these, whether they are less expensive or safer or novel catalysts or whatever, um, the exact mechanism um, is usually difficult to determine. So the mechanism slash rate law. Usually they, they go hand in hand, right? If you figure out the mechanism, that the mechanism is the rate law. Um, it will tell you what the rate law needs to be. And then another big one um, is biocatalysis. In two, sense, two senses, right? Either can we better understand catalysis in biosystems or can we take the protein structure or something like that from a, a catalyst that we have found in a living organism um, and engineer it to work outside of that organism? So if we find a, a, a strain of algae that can eat sugar and produce biofuel, can we do that without the actual organism? No is the answer right now, but it'd be great if we could because um, that would make for a great biofuel, something like that. Uh, can we take those things out of a, a, a living organism and attach them to a surface, um, you know, all, all sorts of interesting biocatalysis. Can we come up with new ones? Um, yeah, if uh, some bacteria can eat plastic. Well, I don't know if they're bacteria or not. All I know is they're living organisms and they can break down plastic. If we could get whatever the thing is that they're doing out of them so that we could do it more efficiently, that would be very nice as well. All of these um, go hand in hand in, in sort of a, a, a loop. Um, there's not really ever a start or a stop. Um, it requires three bits, right? It requires uh, theory. It often, at this point, requires computation. Um, so computation here is, is the, the area that we're at with um, catalysis, we're, we're pretty much down to quantum at this point. Um, there's not a lot of macro scale stuff left on designing new um, catalysts at, you know, sort of the um, kinetic theory anymore of just molecules bouncing around. We kind of require quantum mechanics, which it is, is itself a version of theory. Um, but to actually, excuse me, do the computations, we often require a computer to do them. Um, and then they're always checked um, by experiment. Right, experiment of either checking the rate laws, checking the computations, uh, synthesizing the new particles, uh, analyzing the output, um, you know, whatever, whatever the products are of the, the catalyst, all of those go hand in hand, uh, which is not unusual, right? It, it's virtually any research that we do is um, sort of in a loop that looks like this. So uh, catalysis in general, still a very active area of research both in industry and in academia. Um, so you, you can go in either direction. And any one of those could be, I mean, you could spend a whole PhD just working on theory or a whole PhD working on experiment or a whole PhD working on computation, but you would never do it in isolation, um, right? Your, your thesis may be on one of those, but it's working in a multidisciplinary team with material scientists and physicists and chemists and chemical engineers and um, all sorts of different folks to, to work on it. So. We're, we're taking a pretty high level view of what do we do once we've got the catalyst. Um, but the process of building up that catalyst and identifying catalysts is a, a pretty um, interesting regime um, to work in if you're interested in that kind of stuff. When we take these um, catalyst particles and fix them inside of a tube, Uh, 
uh, we call that um, a packed bed reactor. So if you have these particles of alumina or carbon or, or whatever it is that you want and deposited on them are um, catalyst particles and then you put them inside of a tube and you lock them in place. How do you lock them in place? I mean, the easiest way is just put like a, a wire mesh, like think of a strainer or something like you would use for um, cooking, right? Some, a plate with some holes in it where the holes are a little bit smaller than the particles dump stuff on top of there and then put another plate on top of it to keep it from, from flying out. That's fixing them, right? It, it's not that we glue them into a particular structure. We usually just dump them in there and then seal them somehow, right? With some wire mesh or something like that. Um, but this is in contrast to a type of reactor with catalyst that we've already seen before, which was the fluidized bed. So the fluidized bed reactor was uh, the version of the CSTR uh, if we wanted to process a gas. Um, that fluidized bed, the, the word fluidized meant that those particles were actively moving around um, inside of that volume. And that's uh, in contrast to what we're now studying, which is called a packed bed, um, where the particles are, are fixed. Um, occasionally, you will also see this actually called a fixed bed reactor. Again, in, in contrast to a fluidized bed reactor, um, it, it just depends on what it is that you're, you're, you're after. So if we look at, eh, let's make that a little bit bigger here. Try to sketch a lot of these um, concepts actually happening inside of a reactor. Let's see what we got. So there's our standard reactor starts off looking pretty much like a plug flow reactor. So there'll still be material coming in and material coming out. Just like with um, CSTRs, there's usually only one, or CSTRs and PFRs, there's usually only one inlet and one outlet, although that is not required, um, it, it's possible. And then inside of this are all of our catalyst particles. Um, and I, this is about the only time I'm going to draw all of the catalyst particles. Uh, most of the time we'll just draw a straight tube and the only way that you'll know whether it is a uh, pack bed reactor or a plug flow reactor is based on the problem statement um, because as you can see it takes a little while to draw all these particles uh, and they're just sort of wedged inside of there right they're not really glued in place um, actually one of the problems that you can have if you're running one of these and it's running at very high temperatures uh, and let's say you've got like an iron or something like that as your, your substrate or your catalyst or whatever, uh, at very high temperatures, those two particles can actually start to sinter together. Um, if two particles are stuck next to each other and they're exposed to very high temperatures, they will glue themselves together, um, not because things are depositing, but the actual structure of the material will join to the adjoint, adjacent particle. You do not want that because now your whole bed is basically welded together. Um, so they, they are all touching, they are all stuck together, but presumably you could take like a little scoop or something like the, the little scoops that you have out on the beach and just scoop this stuff out of there. Um, unfortunately, I don't have my sample jar of a bunch of catalyst particles um, because it's stuck on campus. Um, but when you're thinking of catalyst particles, think of things that are like on the order of about the size of like at their, at their biggest, maybe an M&M. &M. Um, a better size. Oh, oh, I got, oh, I got one. Hold on. I got, I have this downstairs. Oh, this is perfect. Um, yeah, over in chat, plastic BBs, perfect. Nerds, awesome stand-in for catalyst particles. Let me get some of these out of here. Never had, never had nerds before. Yeah, this is this is great. This is almost what the example would have looked like. The only difficulty is I can't. How am I going to hold these things up right? 
Let's see. Can you see that? There you go. You can see the nerds in my hand there, right? That's about the size of the particles that we're talking about. Um, they could vary something like this within a particular reactor. They probably would not vary, right? You would maybe only have all of the yellow nerds or all of the orange nerds or all of the purple nerds or something like that. Within a given reactor, they probably won't vary very much. Um, you probably bought them from a manufacturer and they tried to make them all as uniform as possible. Um, but from reactor to reactor, application to application, they're all you know roughly about this big um, of, of different shapes and different sizes. Sometimes they're cylinders, sometimes they're um, circles some, or spheres or um, tubes or, or, or something like that. So if, if you want to keep a, a picture in your mind of, of roughly what these look like, think nerds, right? Roughly that size. Um, and then on top of the nerds are the actual um, catalyst particles. Yeah, I bet those would be good for stocking up. I mean, they don't go bad. This one's been open for like probably six months. Tastes fine. It's like six months old. It's great. Uh, so if this thing were a PFR, the way that we would analyze something like this would be, okay, we enter over here at V is equal to zero. And then by the time we come out the other side, the process fluid has been exposed to a certain volume of the reactor that we just call V. Are regular catalysts durable? Yeah, yeah, they're usually pretty durable. But that's part of the, the cost of operating them, right, is sometimes they break um, and you got to buy more. So if it were a PFR, we'd, we'd be dealing with things like volume, right? The uh, independent variable that we're used to with PFRs is, is volume. The independent variable that we deal with uh, for packed bed reactors is similar. Um, and in fact, you can use volume for a lot of different calculations in packed bed reactors. But the more common variable that we use is not volume, but weight. Um, and what weight means really is mass. It's just an unfortunate uh, convention in the field um, that we refer to the mass of catalyst inside of the bed as weight. Um, but we don't mean weight in a force sense, we mean weight as in mass. And so in the same sense that in a plug flow reactor when the process fluid enters at V is equal to zero and exits it after some volume V, whatever the volume of the reactor is, in a packed bed reactor, you enter the reactor at W is equal to zero. So the process fluid has been exposed to no weight of catalyst, no mass of catalyst. And then by the time it leaves the reactor, it has been exposed to a W weight of catalyst, however much that is. There is a relationship between the two. It's very a, a very straightforward um, relationship. It's usually provided, um, which is the weight which again, we're gonna call it weight, but what we're really referring to is mass um, and the units will be of mass. So the weight of the bed divided by the volume of the bed. So by weight of the bed, I mean, if you were to take out every one of these particles in here, take them all out, put them on a balance. What does the balance say? What's, what's the mass of particles in there? And then the volume of the bed is, okay, all of these were packed inside of a cylinder. What's the volume of that cylinder? This would be represented by the ratio of W over V. And we have a name for that, which is the density of the bed. So rho sub bed. that letter that's there is the Greek letter rho. So it's density like another density would be. The subscript on it is bed um, because it's saying, okay, how, how much mass of particles can I fit inside the volume of the tube that's in there? And the density of the bed, the rho bed will therefore be a function of things like the material so is it iron, is it palladium, is it iron oxide, is it aluminum or, or whatever it is that you're, is it carbon or whatever? Um, it's also a function of the shape um, of both the particle and the reactor. 
So if your reactor is cylindrical, you may be able to fit more particles than if the reactor is square because the particles may not be able to go down into the corners. Um, and so that's the last part, which is it's also a function of the packing itself. So there are some types of packing which are designed to be what are called dumped packings or random packings where, you know, just picture the, the nerds here. And if I dump them into a cylinder or something like that, they just kind of wind up in a random structure. Um, there's, there's no particular rhyme or reason to them. Um, but there are some types of packing that, that come on uh, preformed sheets and then you stack the sheets in there like bricks. Um, and so those can have a, a different packing. Um, but all of those are, are related to what we call the, the bed density. Um, for us, that's usually just going to be a number that's given to us. Um, but that's what it means, right? It, it means how much mass of catalyst could you fit into the volume of the reactor. The space between the particles, wasn't that a song by Hootie and the Blowfish, Space Between? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Probably came out around the same time Diablo 2 did. The space between the particles um, is called the void space. It's not empty, um, right? Void space is where the process fluid flows. Uh, and so in our little sketch that we've got up here, void space is sort of this red area that's on the outside of the particles. And I am definitely not going to cover this entire piece, right? That area that's outside of there. Um, I'll change this to red. That's the void space. Um, the void space is where the process fluid flows. Um, it's not desirable, to, or, or I shouldn't say it's not desirable. There is a trade-off between how much catalyst you pack into a system and what conversion that you can get out of that system. And the trade-off usually comes from something that we're going to look at in a little bit, which is pressure drop. Um, if you pack in a bunch of catalysts the size of, say, the green nerd that's right here. I don't know if you can see the, oh, I just dropped it. Anyway, think really tiny, right? If you pack sand into a cylinder, you can pack a ton of sand into there. But the problem is you've taken up all the void space. The void space is very, very small. There's not a lot of room for the process fluid. And so it can require an absolutely enormous amount of pressure to push these things through um, a bed of sand. On the other hand, if, if you put in something, I think you'll be able to see this one, something like the orange nerd that's a little bit bigger like this, there is less catalyst in there, but there's more void space, right? And so there's an optimization between how much process fluid do you let in there through the void space and how much catalyst do you put in there through your catalyst particle, excuse me. Um, and so that, that ratio of the, the void space to the um, volume of the reactor itself, right? So if these are our particles and they're solid, we are referring to the void space as that area through which gas can flow around the particles like this. That is our, our void space in there. The, the fraction of the volume inside of the bed that is void or the, the volume that is the actual process fluid um, is called the void fraction. So the void fraction is defined uh, as the volume of space inside of your reactor that is sort of quote unquote taken up by the void, um, which is also the volume through which the process fluid flows. So it's, it's not void, you know, like space is a void. Hey, don't forget the uh, ISS on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Go look at the previous lecture if you don't know what I'm talking about. The International Space Station will be available on for viewing on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The volume of the void divided by the total volume of the bed. So how much free space um, is inside of there? Uh, question in chat, can PBRs only be used for gas phase fluids? No, you can definitely use them for a um, liquid phase, but they do find the majority of their applications in, in gas phase um, systems. Liquid phase systems that require catalysts often use homogeneous catalysts. So you might dump sulfuric acid or something in there and just mix it all up. Um, and so you don't often need the particles um, if you're in the liquid phase. But there's no reason that you can't. Um, it, it works for both. 
Um, so this is given the special symbol of phi, which is not a, a zero. Um, this is the Greek letter phi. It's not a zero with a, a line through it or something like that. Um, occasionally you'll see it drawn as like the more fancy phi um, that looks like this, which is fine if you, if you want to drive it, draw it like that, it's totally okay. This typically ranges on the order of about 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 in most reactors. But that is not at all like a requirement. Um, you can definitely get, actually you can't get too much lower than that. I think like 0.37 is like the theoretical lowest you can get for spheres. Um, well, I guess you could get lower if you made square packing because um, then you could fit it perfectly inside of there. At any rate, most of the time, the void fraction tends to be somewhere on the order of 0.4 to 0.6. So between 40 and 60% of the volume inside of the reactor is open area for the um, process fluid to flow through. The material balance on a packed bed reactor Um, and a packed bed reactor, by the way, we're going to, a ooh, packed burr, packed bed reactor. Um, we're going to abbreviate that as PBR as opposed to PFR. Fortunately, the packed bed reactor looks very similar, or the material balance on a packed bed reactor looks very similar to the material balance on a plug flow reactor. Um, and in fact, you can go from one to the other just by multiplying by a constant. Um, and we're, we'll just briefly show that here. If you imagine a control volume uh, inside of our reactor that looks like that, that's a big control volume, but whatever. Um, the way that we set up this control volume previously, if we were doing a plug flow reactor, was we started off at the inlet defining this as some volume V, and the outlet was some volume V plus delta V. Right, so we took this little infinitesimal slice of size V plus, or of size delta V, um, and we said, well, when you go in, you've seen volume V. By the time you come out, you've now been exposed to volume V plus delta V. We do the same thing with um, pack bed reactors. Uh, the only difference is that um, we can change it from a um, volume over to a mass. So what we end up doing with that is instead we come in at a weight W and we come in out at a weight W plus delta W. So our material balance then, we still get the classic accumulation equals in minus out plus change um, because it's always gonna be steady state for us uh, in minus out plus change. By the way, if you're bored of steady state, we have a whole class dedicated to non-steady state, which is our controls class. So eventually that zero will not be there anymore. Actually, the very last reactor we look at, the batch reactor, it's not steady state. So eventually we'll have more on here. So what does this look like then? Um, still get a zero. The amount of any material I, N sub I, entering that control volume is N sub I evaluated at W. And then the amount leaving is N sub I evaluated at W plus delta W. And then the amount that um, reacted in here, this is the part that has to change a little bit. Um, and so I'm gonna do a little sketch, uh, not really a sketch, just a little bit of quick algebra over here on the, the side. The change parameter uh, used to be R sub I times delta V. That was for the PFR. Um, this still holds for the, the pack bed reactor. The only difference is we don't want to use delta V anymore. We want to use uh, delta W, right? Because we're talking about weight of catalyst rather than volume. So how do we switch from delta V to delta W? We use this relationship with the density of the bed, right? If, any, if I know volume, I can always get the weight by multiplying the volume times the density of the, the bed or vice versa, right? I can go in the other direction. So an entirely equivalent definition of change is to say R sub I, and then instead of delta V, I can move the delta V over to the right-hand side and move the row bed over to the left-hand side um, and get a quantity that looks like delta W divided by row bed. 
right? So it's, it's fundamentally exactly the same change quantity. It's how much of, our, of, of species I changed in that little volume that we're in. It's just that we prefer to refer to that as per unit um, catalyst weight rather than per unit reactor volume because the weight is usually the important thing with a, a catalyst um, or a pack bed reactor. And so we'll tack that change term on down here and say plus R sub I divided by rho bed times delta W. That should look really similar to the material balance that we had for a plug flow reactor. The only change that we've got other than switching from W's and delta W's is that we've introduced this rho bed term and it's just a conversion factor, right? It's how do we go from a delta V to a delta W? Well, they're related by rho bed um, in this particular way. Um, and that's the, the big change um, that we've got from a plug flow reactor to a pack bed reactor. Uh, if you rearrange this, um, you know, get it into its, its differential form. So if we rearrange and then we take the limit uh, as delta W approaches zero. So we, we get to a very small slice, um, an infinitely small slice. What we will end up with is D N sub I DW uh, is equal to R sub I divided by rho bed. Um, and this comes up often enough, this ratio of something divided by rho bed, that comes up so often in packed bed reactors that we introduce a, a special notation for it, um, which is that this is also equal to R sub I, and then we put a prime marker on it. So that little dash there is, is supposed to be a prime. Let me try and get it just right. There we go. So Ri prime is just the typical Ri that we're used to, but divided by rho bed. And so this is our material balance, uh, which should look very similar to the way that we saw for a plug flow reactor. Um, and so it's got also um, an initial condition, which is the moles of I entering the reactor, which are now entering at W equals zero instead of V equals zero, um, is still Ni zero. Um, which is the same as, or very analogous to what we saw for a um, plug flow reactor. This is equation 9.1 in your book. Um, and then similarly, the, the EB, the energy balance. So this is a pack bed reactor material balance. That is the general form to it. There's, that gets as complicated as the plug flow reactor one does because of the net rates and stuff like that, but you don't have to add anything to that in order to account for something like that. Um, the energy balance also looks very similar, which is dT dW, right? Instead of dT dV, we've got dT dW. Let's draw, give ourselves a little fraction here. Um, a delta Q minus the sum of all of the reactions Rj delta Hj. So every reaction rate times the enthalpy of reaction for that reaction divided by the sum of N sub I CPI, right? All of that looks the same. The difference is there's these primed quantities. Um, and so RJ here is a primed quantity. Um, and we're going to get more into that. We're coming up on FICA, but I'm going to talk more about that primed quantity and its units here in a moment. Um, but that will be a primed quantity. And also this uh, delta Q will have a prime on it. Uh, and so this mark is our prime mark. Um, and what it just means is per unit catalyst mass. And that's as opposed to the unprimed variables, which are per unit volume. Um, and so we have these prime marks on, on both of those. Um, and we'll get to those. We're, it's 2.45 right now, so I want to make sure we have at least our 10 minutes for FICA. Um, but the first thing we're going to do when we come back is look a little bit more into those units of the prime marks, um, and then we'll uh, look at an example problem. The initial condition here uh, is that the temperature at the inlet, which is when W is equal to zero, uh, is T0, right? Whatever the inlet temperature happens to be, that um, hasn't changed too much. 
this equation is, is 9.2. And this is our pack bed reactor energy balance. Those should look really, really similar to um, what you would have seen for the plug flow reactor, um, which is great because almost all of the tools that we have for a plug flow reactor, we just translate them almost directly over to a pack bed reactor. We just got to watch those primes. Um, and that's what we're going to work on after FICA. Um, it looks like we got a couple of um, questions over in chat. I'm actually going to hold off on those questions until I get um, back here in a couple of minutes, but I'll, I'll answer um, both of those questions over there. Let's get some quick, we got to do, uh, whatchamacallit, Kevin, um, because I'm not really interested in continuing to go through and mark all of my um, YouTube videos as, as demonetized. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. What do we want to listen to? Ooh, he's got new stuff. Yeah, let's go classic. Let's do monkeys. Yeah, I like monkeys. Ah, that's too much. Scheming weasel it is. There we go. All right, I will be back in like five minutes. I'm going to go make myself some tea for Fika because we're at the end of our first lecture period. Um, and then when I get back, there's a couple of questions in chat. Um, I'll respond to, to each one of those. Uh, just a quick note for those who are still sitting here, too. Um, uh, if you emailed me over the past day or two, I just answered, I think, all of the emails. Um, so while you have me here, too, if you have any questions about my email response, you can just message me privately in chat.
Where's our scheming weasel go? There it is. Okay, let's hit those questions. We still got like nine minutes for Fika, so I'm just gonna answer some of the questions over in chat. Oh yeah, I'll open up chat too. <clears throat> let's see. Um, for homework five, there shouldn't be any like missing continuity, but they may not go all the way out to the end of the x-axis. Um, I, I think I scaled them to, sh to stop just before that. If, however, though, your pressure drop drops to zero before you get to the volume of the reactor, that suggests that there could be a, a problem somewhere. It, it should be able to make it all the way out. In fact, the pressure drop should be very, very little. Um, it, like. By the time it exits, the, the P over P naught should be like 0.999, something like that. So very close to no pressure drop. Um, for problem one, three. Oh yeah, so I think problem one, three, you're referring to calculating the total um, chemical oxygen demand. Yeah, it's just, it's the equation that they give you in there. Just drop the subscripts. Um, and the reason I ask you to drop the subscripts is because just below there, we set the system up with a recycle. Um, and so if you were to, def to define it with a subscript of one, it would look like you're only defining that for stream one, but it can be defined for any of those streams. Um, and so a more general version is just drop the subscripts. Um, but yeah, it, it, you basically have to write it yourself because you don't want the subscripts, um, but it's pretty much just copying theirs. Uh, yeah, 201.09 is, is probably pretty darn close. The, the bigger difference will be after you run it in its loop, um, see how close you get after that. If, if you're within, I don't know, 10, 20%, something like that, I wouldn't worry too much about it. You're welcome. No, that sudden drop is, is normal. I mean, it's not, it's not like normal in the sense that there's any particular reason for it. It's just those are, that can happen with successive substitution. But you, it should re reverse itself. Yeah, as you said in the, the your chat message, it should correct itself in the next iteration or so. But uh, it, yeah, it's just how it goes. If you were using something other than successive substitution, you may not see that sudden drop. Um, just kind of depends. Um, so for any more information on the homework plots, I'm not going any more than what the um, graphs already show. So you'll have to use your best judgment. So John asked me if it was intentional that I left out the graph for the counterflow example for 5.4. Yeah, that was intentional. Um, I, if, if you got pretty darn close with the coflow, um, then you'll be in pretty good shape for the counterflow. But I've, I deliberately left that one out as a suggested answer.
Um, that's a good question about the, the liquid catalyst. I haven't really thought of that. Um, we would probably, so the, the separation that we have is between what's called a heterogeneous catalysis system, where the reacting fluid is in one, fl one phase and the catalyst is in another phase. Um, and then that's contrasted with what we call a homogeneous catalysis system or um, homogeneous catalyst. Uh, and so that's a case where both the catalyst and the process fluid are in the same phase. So like liquid, liquid, something like that. Um, and normally if they're in the same phase like that, then we treat it as though the homogeneous catalyst, like an, an acid or something like that, is evenly distributed throughout the entire volume. And so we would treat that more like a plug flow reactor um, as opposed to a packed bed reactor. And we would just count, yeah, the, the catalyst would be, in terms of like the, the material balance, it would be treated like an inert as it runs down through the, the plug flow reactor, if you had a, a homogeneous system. You can't really like fix a liquid catalyst, right? It, it, it's going to get carried along with the fluid. Um, so yeah, I, th I think your interpretation there's a good way to put it, right? It'll look like a PFR with an inert sitting in it. You're welcome. By the way, speaking of um, copyright strikes, if you go onto YouTube and try to watch one of the videos, the solution for the copyright strike is to mute the section that's got the audio in it. If it's got something that you need to hear um, that got muted, it, it should only mute up to that music, but who knows what their algorithm looks like. Um, but you can still hear the, the full version of it through Canvas. Um, if you watch it on any of those, those are not... Um, subject to the same restrictions. So if, if you think you missed something in there, just check it out on Canvas. It's got the full recording. I, I think the classical was okay, John. I, I don't think that that got a copyright strike. It was the Studio Ghibli definitely got one. Uh, that one got several. Um, I can't remember the other ones that got it. So it's about, what is it, three and what time? Oh, right there, 301. Let's take about another minute um, for anybody out walking around. We'll, go, we'll get started here again at 302. Good timing on scheming weasel. Okay, let's keep on going. So I, I had said right before we were gonna um, break for uh, Fika that we were gonna look at these prime marks and, and 
look at those in a little bit more detail. Uh, let's go ahead and knock that out and then we'll look at a, an example here. The, anytime you see a prime mark, um, it's, the, it's defined as the thing without the prime divided by rho bit. So when we have delta Q prime, and I'll keep, for now I'm gonna mark those primes in blue just to, to highlight them so that we don't um, forget that the, the primes are there. But as we keep going, we're, I'll just write the primes in, in normal font so you, it won't always be blue. Um, so our delta Q prime means take the old value which was unprimed, so that's just delta Q, and divide it by row bed. Right? And that's row bed, by the way, will always be a constant. There's, there will never be a time where the density of the bed um, is like a function or something like that. Because again, the, the density of the bed is talking about how much mass of catalyst did I fit inside this volume of a tube. That it, tell you what, you've got really big problems if the mass of catalysts in your system is changing or if the volume of the bed itself is changing, because that means you're taking stuff out. It probably means something burst open, um, which is not good. So the density of the bed is, is constant. Um, it's, it's not gonna change. Um, the delta Q up here is the same that we've seen before. So it's a heat transfer coefficient times a surface area per, per volume ratio, which we call A, little a, um, and then times the temperature of the utility minus T, right? Whatever the temperature of the process fluid is. All of that divided by rho bed. Um, this in your book is 9.25. So again, a lot of this looks really familiar compared to plug flow reactors, right? We went from a W and we put in a row bed, or we went from a V to a W and we added row bed. We put a prime up here on Q because it's being divided by row bed. We put a, a prime on R because it's being divided by row bed. Um, so it's essentially the same equation, just scaled by a constant. Um, that's, that's the only difference um, that we've got here. I think I can fit the rest of this on this little page right here. Um, let's take a look at some of the units and then we'll do an example. What are some of the units that come up? Um, most often W, uh, which by the way, this is supposed to be a capital W because I am putting the caps on either side. On the other hand, I don't believe there's any other symbol anywhere in the text that is a lowercase W. Um, at least not that I can remember off the top of my head. Uh, and so I may not always put the caps on the W, but there's only one W. Um, we don't have the same problem here with like V and V of being lowercase and uppercase. It is supposed to always be a capital W just because that's kind of the, the standard in the field, um, but it, it doesn't need to be. So the units on W um, are units of mass, right? Again, it's called the weight of the catalyst, but we really mean mass. Uh, and so this is gonna be things like gram of catalyst or kilograms of catalyst. So the subscript cat there stands for catalyst. Um, I try to include the cat as often as I can because otherwise you can get into situations where you have like gram per gram and it looks a little bit strange uh, because you could refer to gram of process fluid versus gram of catalyst. Um, for example, in your uh, midterm project, right, if, if we had a catalyst inside of there, we're talking about grams per cubic meter in a lot of cases in there, and it could get confusing. Are you talking about grams of the process fluid or are you talking about grams of the catalyst? So hopefully it will be indicated that we are talking about grams of catalyst, but do not at all be surprised if you go out and read literature or work with groups or something like that, and they simply refer to it as grams and kilograms. It, it could be, you'll just have to use as best context clues as you can to figure out if they're talking about the process grams or the catalyst grams. I will try to use the cats as often as I can to keep it clear, but it could be grams or kilograms. It, there's also no reason that it couldn't be pounds of catalyst as well. It's perfectly fine. Um, if we look at the units of our rate, um, this is where it gets a little bit different from what we saw before. Remember the rate that we're using is Ri prime, right? So this is our, our rate. Anytime that we need a rate in our energy balance or a rate in our material balance, it's an Ri prime. Um, and so that little prime mark means Take the normal one that you've got, which is R sub I, divided by rho bed. Uh, 
And if we take a look at the units on here, the units of R sub i were something like amount per volume per time. So we've seen that very commonly as like moles per liter per second or kilomoles per cubic meter per hour or something like that. We're now dividing it by a density of a bed uh, and the density of the bed is however many kilograms of catalyst you have per unit volume. These two volumes are the same thing. Per unit volume of reactor and the per unit volume over here are both per unit volume of the reactor. Um, they're, they're referring to the same thing. Um, and so often the Ri prime that we get uh, has units of amount per mass per time. So rather than actually kg cat here, it's more like mass of catalyst which has common units of things like kg cat. Um, you know, maybe it's moles per gram of catalyst per second. Uh, maybe it's kilomoles per kilogram catalyst per hour, right? So this is something, some combination of, of those, depending on what the, the problem statement is. The, the problem statement may give you one or the other. Um, it could give you the RI or it could be giving you the RI prime. How do you know the difference? How do you know which one you've been given? Look for whether or not it's per unit volume or if it's per unit mass. If it's per unit volume, then you're being given the plain old R, right? If you're given like a, a rate law or something and it says the, the units of that are moles per liter per time, you're being given the R sub I. If though you're being given something like a mass over here, like a, a mole per gram cap per minute, something like that, now you're being given the Ri prime. Um, and so the only way to know the difference for that as to whether or not do I need to divide by row bed or not um, is just the units. Um, so you'll just have to check the units to see um, whether or not you're being given Ri or Ri prime. Um, let the let the units guide you to decide whether or not you're being given um, R or Ri prime. Scooch that up a little bit. So I'll leave that there, uh, and we'll look at an example of this. So in our um, example reaction, let's say that we've got our pack bed reactor. So again, I'm not going to draw the little particles every single time. Um, if I really need to make it clear what we've got, I'll just label it as the pack bed reactor. But you'll also know because it'll ask for things like weight of catalyst or something like that. Uh, coming in over here, so the, the whole thing is going to be gas phase which is common for PBRs, but uh, you know, we can do like homework problems and stuff for liquid phase. Um, and they, they just don't happen to occur um, you know, in a real instance all that often. So coming in over here are four, four moles per hour of A, sorry, not four moles, four kilomoles, four kilomoles of A per hour. Uh, we've got 10 kilomoles of inert, so kilomoles of I per hour. Uh, and these are coming in at 500 degrees C and two bar. The reaction that's happening inside of here, let's detail some of our reactions over here. Uh, A um, is going to B plus two C. Uh, which is not an uncommon kind of reaction. Often if we have like a hydrocarbon or something that we're trying to, you know, form a double bond somewhere or, excuse me, close a loop or something like that, often the C that's here will be some kind of hydrogen, right? And we'll, we'll typically pop off a couple of hydrogens from something. Um, so this is a very common form of, of um, rate, or not rate, uh, reaction. The rate will be uh, elementary, so we'll just say that the rate is equal to KCA. The K value that we've got, we'll just say it's constant at the um, temperature that we're interested in, 7.5 
times 10 to the minus 5 per second. Um, and the density of our bed, row bed. Again, the density of the bed generally has to be given to you, or if it's one of those you know, homework style problems where um, you know everything else and you have to calculate the density of the bed. Mm. Possible, but most of the time it's just given to you because it is, I mean, it's like using a graduated cylinder or something, right? You dump some mass inside of there and figure out the volume it took up. Um, it, it's rare that row bed is something that you have to calculate um, unless somebody is trying to be clever with their um, problem statement. Uh, and so this is 1800 kilograms of catalyst per cubic meter of reactor, right? And remember that the density of the bed is not the same as the density of the catalyst. Did I, I, I think I may have missed that on my previous um, slide. Oh yeah, pause. Let's go back to the void fraction. You just need one more line in your, your notes. Um, I forgot to relate the void fraction to the um, density of the particle itself. It's not that we need this for this example. I just, I want you to know it. Um, it it's an important thing. So pause on the example, go back up into your notes. Um, and we're just going to add one more line right next to the void fraction here. So I'm going to delete this bit here, right underneath the void fraction. The void fraction is uh, a tool that you can use to relate the density of the particle itself to the density that's in the bed. Um, and so the relationship that we have here is that if the density of the bed is, let's put this in, uh, how about pink so you can see it, purple, whatever, row bed uh, is equal to one minus phi uh, times the density of the catalyst. So the density of the catalyst means if I had a spherical particle of iron, the density of the catalyst is the density of iron um, or the density of carbon or the density of aluminum oxide, right? Whatever that um, particle happens to be made of, that's its actual density. Uh, you know, iron, ceramic, whatever you have. The density of the bed is related to it, but it's always less by a factor of one minus phi because those now spherical particles can't pack as though they are a solid piece of catalyst, right? It's not solid iron or solid carbon or solid aluminum oxide or something like that. Um, so I can't believe I forgot to do that. We don't need this for the homework problem. It's just a, a relationship between the two um, in case you ever need it. If somebody gives you the density of, for example, iron and tells you that those iron catalysts are packed in there with a packing fraction or a void fraction of 50%, then one minus 50% times the density of iron tells you what the density of that bed happens to be. Um, so this is also described in more detail in your book. I just didn't want to overlook it here um, because you can go back and forth. Um, between the two. The density of the bed will always be less um, than the density of the catalyst because of this one minus phi thing right here. Assuming that it's packed, right? It's not just a solid piece of metal. Okay, back to our example. I didn't want to um, go too far back, but here we are. Let's change our... our ink color here. Um, what equation number was that? Ah, uh, that's a really good question. I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, it should be right after the material balance um, or like right around the material balance. Um, so just after, the, in the very first section of, of chapter eight is where it is. Uh, so the question that we're trying to answer, 9.6, thank you. Somebody said it was equation 9.6. Um, the question that we're trying to answer is find out how much catalyst W uh, to produce three kilomoles of B per hour. Right, so how big, it's a, a question that's very similar to the types of questions we would ask for plug flow reactors. For PFRs, we would say, how, what's the size of the volume that we need, right? It, if it's a cylinder, how long does it need to be and what's its diameter? Here we're asking a different question, which is how much catalyst do I need? What's W um, in order to, to solve something like this? Um, our approach for that looks 
very similar to the way that it did for a plug flow reactor. So we start with our, oh, I forgot to mention, this is isothermal and isobaric because I want to be able to solve this by hand. So we're going to make some assumptions there. And so everything that's given to us, it's just at the conditions that we need, um, 500 C and, and two bar. So we start off with our material balance, DNA, DV, uh, DW. Um, it's going to be equal to RA prime. And then we have to look at uh, what are we actually being given? So we have been given R is equal to KCA. This will have um, units of an inverse second because of the K. So we'll have a second down here. And then the C sub A has not changed, right? It's the same old C sub A we've always seen before. And so this will have units of something like amount per volume. And so what's being given to us up here is just the plain old R, right? There was no prime on this R, but what we need is the actual primed value. So we have to take the R that was given to us and divide it by the density um, in order to get RA prime. So instead of RA prime here, we've also got R sub A divided by rho bit. And R sub A is the same one that we've seen before, which is minus KCA and now divided by rho bit. Typically that sort of distinction um, is most often made just by looking at the units. Um, not everybody in all publications follows that notation of the prime. Um, some of them just use it as, um, or some of them leave it out and use the units as a, a stand-in for that. So sometimes you just have to dig through units um, in order to figure that out. Um, this is also equal to minus K. The concentration of A is N sub A divided by V. So we've got a V and a rho bed. Remember that V is our volumetric flow rate, V. And our volumetric flow rate, because it's a gas, um, is not going to be constant. Uh, and we're going to be left with minus K uh, times NT0. Uh, divided by V0 times rho bed times Na divided by Nt. All right, so from going from one of these to the next, I took the V here and I said that V is equal to V0 times Nt over Nt0, T over T0, P0 over P. Uh, but two of those cancel. Um, the T over T0 and the P0 over P0 both went to one, but because my stoichiometry is not one to one, right? I start off with one molecule. Um, if I destroy that one molecule, I end up with three. Uh, and so the, the stoichiometry there implies that the total number of moles um, is not gonna be constant. Uh, every time that reaction happens, we get another two molecules of, of stuff. Um, and then the, the step to actually get to where we are was just a little bit of algebra to, um, rearrange it to get it a little bit nicer. The reason that I think it's a little bit nicer here is because these are all constant, right? The K, the NT0, the V0, and the rho bed, we know those from the problem statement. So I lumped all those together as a constant. Um, and then I put the other two um, next to it, right? So these will be constant uh, and these will be functions of NA. They're constant for this problem, right? If, if the system were not isothermal, then K would probably not be constant. You'd have to adjust it with an activation energy. Um, they, they just happen to be constant for, for this problem. So we end up with a separable differential equation. Um, and so we can move this stuff around and write uh, N sub T over NA times DNA has to be equal to uh, minus K times NT0 divided by V0 times rho bed, and that'll be DW. And then we have to integrate these from NA0, which occurs when W is equal to zero, up to whatever the value of NA is uh, when we have some catalyst weight, W. But we have to work a little bit because um, we have this NT sitting here. Um, so we have to uh, expand that a little bit 
in order to get it to work out. Uh, in this expression, uh, our nt is the sum na plus nb plus nc plus, don't forget the inert, right? There's, there's always inert floating around. And now we have to do whatever stoichiometric tricks we want um, to express all of the terms here as functions of Na. Why functions of Na? Just because that's the one that I chose to use my um, integral here for. So if we had written it in terms of conversion, then all these would have to be written in terms of conversion or, or Nb. If you wanted to use Nb, that would be totally fine. Um, based on the stoichiometry of the problem, um, the extent of reaction squiggle, just to remind you that this is still a totally valid thing to do, squiggle is fine. We've actually used it several times in our examples up until now. Um, we just usually overlooked it, and here I'm, I'm trying to explicitly show you the use of squiggle. So this tells us three things. Um, it tells us that n sub b uh, is going to be equal to squiggle and will therefore be equal to Na0 minus Na, right? And that's just based on the stoichiometry of our problem. Similarly, n sub c is equal to 2 squiggle, uh, which is equal to 2 times Na0 minus Na. Um, and then our inerts uh, are equal to 0 times squiggle which is, or no, I'm sorry, not zero times squiggle. It is um, the amount of inerts coming in plus zero times squiggle, which is just the amount of inerts coming in. There was no B or C coming in, um, and so we didn't have to um, do anything to those. Uh, we can now combine all of those uh, in order to figure out that, oh, go back to black, N sub T is equal to 3 times Na0 plus Ni minus 2 times Na, which is fine, right? Because the Na0 is constant, the Ni is constant, there's only one, and the only thing that's varying here is Na. Um, and so we have written now our N sub T as a function of Na, and so we can substitute that into our um, integral. So our integral now looks like 3 Na0 plus Ni divided by Na minus 2 times dNa. And that has to be equal to minus the integral of, of k nt0 divided by v0, rho bed. The two that came up right there, um, I just canceled some stuff out. All right, if I took this nt here and plugged it in up here, um, this term now gets divided by an na, as you see here, uh, and then the two na over here also got divided by na, uh, and so therefore we have a, a two floating around as well. And we go ahead and integrate these. Right, we're going from Na0 up to Na and 0 to W. This is not actually that bad of an integral. Like It, it looks kind of nasty initially, um, but you've just got a 1 over Na type term here multiplied by a constant, and then the integral of another constant over here. So it looks a little bit worse than it really is. Um, it, it's not too bad. Um, if you go ahead and integrate that and rearrange it a little bit, um, so I'm going to take, remember we were asked for weight, w. So I'm going to take this whole term and move it over to the other side um, so that the result on the right-hand side will just be w. So that means that we'll have minus v0 rho bed divided by k and t0. And then this will be multiplied by whatever the result of the integral on the left-hand side is, um, which ends up looking like 3 times na0 plus ni. So that's all a big constant term. Uh, if you integrate 1 over Na from Na0 to Na, uh, you get natural log of Na over Na0. And then minus a 2, which is a constant, 
uh, that'll be Na minus Na0. All of this then will be equal to W. And we should just check that that is going to be the case, right? We um, should end up with the units of W as being something like a mass. Um, and so we, we should check each one of these. Uh, the V0 here will be something like a cubic meter per hour uh, multiplied by a bed, which will be a kilogram of catalyst per cubic meter. The K um, is a one over seconds. And the NT0 um, is going to end up being, wait a minute, something looks, oh, sorry, I put the seconds on the wrong side. The K is in the denominator, but it's one over seconds, so it's actually in the numerator for a unit. Um, the NT0 is going to be something like a kilomole per hour. And then it's going to get multiplied by all of this stuff inside of here, all of which have units of kilomoles per hour. Um, and so that's the, the units inside of there. Uh, which is kilomoles per hour. So the flow terms cancel with their units. The cubic meters cancel. We are going to have to watch our unit conversions because we've got a seconds and an hours here, but they're both time units, right? So we'll have to convert one of those over to, to hours. Um, and then once we do that, these two will also cancel. Um, and so we will be left with this whole big expression. We'll have units of something like kilograms per catalyst which is what we wanted, right? It's just a sanity check on, on making sure that we didn't flip anything around one way or the other um, and, we, and that we got everything that we needed. Um, just some of the numbers that we have um, inside of here are N sub A um, is going to be equal to N sub A zero minus squiggle. And we already know what squiggle is because squiggle is also equal to the moles of uh, B. So Na0 minus Nb. How did I know that? Uh, that came from this sort of analysis up here, right? So I can use my stoichiometry to say that every time that reaction happens once, I get a mole of B. Every time that reaction happens twice, or sorry, once, I get two moles of C. Every time that reaction happens, I don't change the number of moles of I. So you don't have to use squiggle there. Um, if, if you can just eyeball the equation and say like, oh yeah, I know every time I do that, I get it's, it's one to one A to B or two to one C to A. Um, whichever way the stoichiometry is, is clearest to you, uh, it's one of those great times where I can just tell you, we have to get the same answer, um, whichever way we go about it. Uh, moles of A being fed is four. The moles of B um, is the thing that we want, right? This is supposed to be our target is three kilomoles per hour. That was our problem statement. Um, how much, what is the size of W? What is the magnitude of W we need in order to make N sub B equal three kilomoles per hour? Um, and so our N sub A that's exiting our reactor um, is going to be one kilomole per hour. Um, NT0, uh, we already know because that's everything that was given to us. Uh, there was four moles of A coming in and 10 moles of an inert. So this was 14 kilomoles per hour. Our rate constant K uh, was given to us as 7.5 times 10 to the minus five per second. But as we mentioned a moment ago, we got to do a unit conversion on that because everything else is in hours. We could take everything else and turn it into seconds. Um, that would be fine. Um, but there seem to be more hours floating around than seconds. So I just decided to make everything in terms of hours. So this ends up being 0 0.2736 per hour. And then our volumetric flow rate V0 comes from our ideal gas law, which is NT0 RT0 divided by P0, uh, which is 4.5 times 10 to the minus four cubic meters per hour. Not very much. That is not a lot of flow. So if we look back through and just briefly check what what do we know? Do we know everything? Uh, we just calculated V0. 
row bed was given to us. We just adjusted K, we calculated NT0, NA0 and NI were given. Uh, we calculated A, NA0, NA and NA0. So we're good to go, right? We can take all of these numbers and plug them back into that big expression that we've got up there. Um, and the units will come out to be something like kilograms of catalyst, right? Whatever our mass of um, catalyst needed to be, which in this case will follow the units of row bed. Um, as long as all the other units work out, then the units of mass will be kilograms of catalyst because that's what's coming in in, in row bed. So if we do that, we end up with W. Uh, will be equal to about 5.18 kilograms of catalyst. And that, strictly speaking, was what the uh, question was asking us to do, right? In order to get three kilomoles per hour of B for all of those other conditions that we have, we require five kilograms of catalyst, slightly 5.2 kilograms of catalyst, right? Something like that. If you, the, the same as we can always take a volume for a PFR um, and turn it into some kind of a meaningful number, like a, you know, if, if the tube is as big as your head around, how long does it have to be or something like that? You can frequently go back and forth between kilograms of um, catalyst and volume of reactor um, because we can also say that the corresponding volume, which is how big does the reactor have to be in order to hold that 5.2 kilograms, um, is equal to whatever the weight of catalyst is divided by the density of the bed, right? That's, that's what those two mean. Um, and so if you take 5.18 and divide it by 1800, uh, what you end up with is about 2.88 liters, right? Which is about the size of a soda bottle, which is pretty tiny, right? But we're not reacting a lot of stuff. Four times 10 to the minus four cubic meters per hour, a pretty small flow rate. Um, so we have a, a pretty small reactor here. Notice though, it, it doesn't say anything. It just says 2.8 liters, right? It, it doesn't say necessarily what the diameter or the length are. That's a question that can't be answered with the information that's given here. Um, in order to know that, that's, that's more of a, there, there are some things that we can do to estimate what a reasonable answer would be, and they come down to pressure drop, like we had learned about a couple of days ago. Um, and we have a special equation for pressure drop in a packed bed um, that we'll spend more time on later. Um, so the, the question of how do I make those 2.88 liters, are they, is it really tiny and really long, or is it really fat like this and really short? Uh, there are other things that we would need to know in order to answer that kind of a question. Um, we can't answer it yet with the, the information that we've got. Um, if we wanted to do this in um, MATLAB, I'm not gonna open up MATLAB because I don't actually get to code that often in, by hand. Hey, whether you think this is a good thing or a bad thing, normally my midterms in this class ask you to code MATLAB by hand. You don't have to do that. Personally, I thought those were always the easiest questions on the exams because I would give you part of the template and all you had to do was follow the template. Um, I don't know if that opinion was shared by students who took that. So maybe you got lucky, maybe you didn't. Uh, maybe the midterm is, or the midterm project is harder than writing this by hand. Um, but I didn't. It, it usually actually went pretty well. I used to do these in-class activities to just to make you feel worse since we're in quarantine. Um, I would print out all the lines of code on uh, does anybody remember what a compact disc is? I hope people remember what a compact disc is uh, or DVD or something like that. You can buy sheets of labels for those. I would print out the code on each, each line of code would get its own sticker label. It was in color, it was amazing. Um, and then they were all shuffled up. And so I would have everybody dis divide into groups and I would hand you a sheet of stickers that had all the MATLAB code on it. And you would have like 20 minutes or something like that to work as a group to take the stickers off and generate MATLAB code that would actually solve the problem. It was great. I loved it. Um, I had so much fun putting those together. And I think people had fun doing them, um, right? It, it's like, when was the last time I played with stickers? And there's a, there's a certain, yeah, it's a, like a bonus problem or something, but there's a certain like uh, irreversibility to it, right? Because you couldn't get those stickers off the paper. So you had to be kind of confident about the way that you were building your code. And I, I think it made people um, think about that code um, before they wrote it, which I thought was fun. Um, come back to my class next year. I'm sure we'll be in class in person next year. We'll, we'll do it next year.
So what, what would I do if I wanted to do this in um, MATLAB? If I was up on the script portion, um, before I actually run the ODE 4.5, I would set up my uh, inlets. So I'd have four for A, zero for B, zero for C, and 10 for the inert. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to go fast enough if I change the colors for the comments every time. I'll just put the comments way over here. Um, so this was for NA0, NB0, NC0, and an I zero. And that's the pattern that we're going to follow. It'll always be ABCI um, wherever we have to go. In MATLAB, we don't know, we, we can't ask MATLAB to solve for an arbitrary value of the uh, weight, at least not all by itself. Um, and so we would just have to define some maximum weight that we think is big enough that we would achieve a, an output of three kilomoles per hour of B. So we would just end up having to pick a number like 10. Right? And so this would be our kilograms of catalyst. We would then run the code, find out whether or not we generated three moles per hour of B. If we did, great. If we didn't, up the number of, up the value of W max. We'd have W and N instead of V and N. Uh, these are gonna come from ODE 4.5, which is still going to our function. Uh, it's still going over a span from zero. Now, instead of zero to V, um, it's zero to W max, whatever our weight needed to be. Um, and then our initial conditions are in zero. And then in order to plot everything, we'd have a line like plot W and N. Right, and here, when we do this plot, we would look at uh, n sub b, which is n of all rows comma two. Uh, and we would wanna know where is that equal to three kilomoles per hour. All right, wherever in that plot, it looks like nb is three kilomoles per hour. That's how much weight we need. If we didn't get three kilomoles per hour in the plot that we see, then we go back to w max and just make it a little bit bigger maybe double it, uh, whatever we need. The local function that we would then have will also look pretty similar, dn dw. It's gonna be a function of our um, independent and dependent variables, which are now w and n. Uh, we'd have to define all of our constants, so I'm, I'm not gonna define every single one of these, um, I'll just, Put that we would need to define them. So we would have to have a K, we'd have to have our T, our pressure, uh, our row sub bed. All right, all of these would have to be defined. Those are just constants from the, the problem. Um, we would need to know our stoichiometry. So our new uh, would be minus one, uh, one for B, three, two two for C and zero for inert. So again, this is following that pattern of nu sub A, nu sub B, C, and I. Right, everything is following that uh, value of, of, or that pattern of A, B, C, I. Oh, uh, there's a question in chat. How come NB equals three kilomoles per hour? Only because that's what the problem was asking for. Um, that it, it's, there's nothing deeper than that. It's just the problem asked us, what do we need in order to get three kilomoles per hour of B? Um, we would need our gas constant, um, which the one that I chose to use was 8.314 divided by a thousand. Uh, and this ended up with units of, ooh, did I write the units? Well, let's see, 8.314 has to be cubic meters pascals per mole Kelvin. And then I would have divided by a thousand to get to kilomoles per Kelvin. We're actually doing okay on time. We might as well just throw in the rest of these values. Um, the K was seven times 10 to the minus five. Uh, and then we'd have to multiply it by 3,600 so that we could get it to have units of per hour. 
that's I, I often screw that one up um, because it's an inverse seconds, right? So the seconds is in the bottom. And normally when I'm accustomed to going from seconds to hours, I'm, I almost by default just divide by 3,600. But because it's one over seconds, the 3,600 is actually in the top um, in order to get it to be one over hours. I, I just, I point that out because anytime I can tell you where I usually make my mistakes, I will try to, to do that. Um, Cause we all have our places where we make mistakes. Uh, temperature has got to be in Kelvin. Our pressure has to be in Pascals. It, it's not that it has to be in Pascals. Don't, don't read into it like, oh, the only pressure we ever use is Pascals. Um, it's just useful because everything else here is already defined in those units, right? I've already got a Pascal down here in my R, so I might as well make all of my other ones Pascals as well. But if I wanted to use a different R and use like ATM or bar or something, totally fine. Um, and then our row bed was 1800. And that'll be uh, kilograms of catalyst per cubic meter. Yeah, we're doing fine on time, so we might as well just fill these in. So those are all of our basically constants. Um, if we then wanted to calculate some stuff, the volumetric flow rate um, comes from our ideal gas law. So we need the total number of moles. Uh, and then times R times T divided by P. Right, this is from V is equal to NT RT over P. And this will have units of cubic meters per hour. Um, and then we need our, our rate, right? The rate in general will be K times moles of A. And here the moles of A is whatever's in uh, the first entry of N divided by RV. Um, this will have units of kilomoles per hour. That's coming from the N term. And then there'll be a unit of volume of cubic meters um, because that's what our um, V is carrying around. And then our very last line is to do all of the material balances. So dn dw uh, will be equal to stoichiometric coefficients times r. But remember, this has to be divided now by rho b or rho bed. Uh, because the R that we're calculating here um, is per unit volume, so per cubic meter, um, but the differentials that we're doing are per unit um, mass, so kilogram cap, something like that. Um, so we need to make sure that we don't forget the, the row bed. This is part of the reason why you, you may be seeing in here that uh, I'm putting a lot of units in here. Um, I'm putting the units in here uh, because the units can be um, tricky. So this ends up now being kilomoles per kg cat per hour. Um, there's a question in chat. Do I need to do the element-wise operator here? Uh, this particular one, it, it shouldn't matter. I've, I've tried to be careful about the way that I've structured my two vectors um, so that you could use either one and get the, the same result. Um, I think you will end up with the same one. If you do the element-wise one, um, you should be fine. And if you do the, the matrix multiplication, um, you should also be fine here. The style that I'm using, the, the pattern that I'm trying to follow, um, if you haven't seen that yet in the um, book, look in appendix, I think it's B, for vector forms. You don't have to use vector forms. Um, if, if you're comfortable writing each one of them out, it'll totally work. Um, but that's the uh, style that I'm using here. So I think if I've, if I've got those shapes correct, if I didn't get any of my shapes wrong, um, you can use matrix multiplication here. And then that's our end over here. All right, oh, a little bit too far over here. Let's push that right there. 
And so that'll complete our um, local function. Our local function up here will get called by ODE45, uh, and then we'll get a, a plot um, that comes out. So I'll try to leave that local function on the, the screen here. Um, if you run something like this in MATLAB, um, which again, I'm not gonna open up MATLAB right now because it takes a little bit too much time, um, the W that we'll get will be plotted from zero to 10. Uh, and then all of our species will be over here. Uh, and so the um, moles of I should end up being constant, right? So we'll have moles of I here will be equal to zero. Um, and then we should see three different curves, right? We should see uh, three more curves. B and C will be over here uh, and A, uh, this is not really the scale, I guess A would have to be here. B and C are here. Um, a will curve down like this, uh, B will grow up, and C will grow twice as fast as B. And in order to um, figure out what our answer needs to be, we would look for, if, if this was a three right here, look for the place where B um, wow, that is supposed to be a straight line and that is not at all a straight line. Let's try that again. There we go, that's not bad. Uh, whatever this W is, um, is where B is equal to three. Uh, and so if, if everything has worked out just fine, this will be very close to 5.18, uh, where those units are um, kilograms. And the units over here would be kilomoles per hour. There we have it. Um, that should look familiar, right? It, it should be at least to the point where you say like, I, I've seen stuff like that before. It was with the, pl the plug flow reactor. We've seen stuff like this before, um, but there are some subtle differences. Um, and those subtle differences are we're now doing uh, W as our independent variable. Um, and this row bed often comes up here uh, at some point. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. NI zero is 10, not zero. Um, so the row bed shows up a lot, the W shows up a lot, um, but then everything else has this certain familiarity to it that we've seen with CSTRs, that we've seen with PFRs, and that we are now seeing again with um, pack bed reactors. It's things like, I still gotta get you know, volumetric flow rates, right? I have to adjust those for temperature and pressure. I still have to get rates as molar flow rates divided by volume or concentrations or, um, partial pressures or something like that. And then I still got to multiply them by their stoichiometric coefficients in order to get net rates. Um, you know, that, that sort of stuff, those same elements show up in nearly all of our, our problems and they will continue to show up um, in nearly all of our problems. So there we go, we're at 350. Um, as always, I'll stick around for a little bit. Um, these will obviously be uh, posted um, in case you didn't uh, see something the first time around or you didn't catch something. Um, and then when we come back on Friday, uh, we're just going to keep looking at examples of pack bed reactors um, similar to, to what we've got here. All right. Thank you all very much. Good luck on, you know, homeworks, problem projects, whatever you've got. Um, I'll stick around for five or 10 minutes. We'll throw on some scheming weasel. Stay safe, and we'll see you on Friday with John. Yeah, that's right. So the the temperatures, um, yeah. If if you're doing everything in Kelvin, then it, it would need to be two ninety eight.
Um, so that's a, that's a good question about the heat capacities. They are always constant for a problem. Um, everywhere in every energy balance that we use, heat capacity is always assumed to be constant. And so you have to find a value that you think is relevant for your problem um, and assume that it's constant at that value. And so I believe in that problem statement, I asked you to use the heat capacities at 700 Kelvin. Um, once you find them at 700 Kelvin, then you assume that they no longer change, right? They're just fixed at whatever that value is. If you want to include the um, dependency of heat capacity on temperature, you have to re-derive the entire energy balance so that you can use like one of the hyperbolic or um, polynomial forms. And it, it's not it's not done anywhere in your book. Um, and in fact, most of the time that's never worked out. If somebody needs that level of, of detail, it's probably done in a computer somewhere. Um, so yeah, just pick them as being equal to their values at 700K, and then they're constant at that value. Yeah, you'll have to find the heat capacity for helium, um, but helium is one of those bizarre ones that we know extremely well. Um, and so if you find it anywhere, it's the same from like 10 Kelvin to like five or 6,000 Kelvin, um, it, it barely changes. So any value you find for helium is fine. But yes, you will have to like Google for helium because that's not in your book. Uh, no, John, just chapter nine. Um, we're gonna stick with chapter nine for a bit. We're gonna try and keep things slow here towards the end of the quarter. I strongly suggest, and if, if anybody is still here and, and listening, Give me a yes or a no in chat if you think things are going to get really busy in your other courses at the end of the quarter. Like I just have a feeling that most courses are going to try to get really, really busy at the end of the quarter. Um, and I am trying to actively work against that um, in our class. So we're just going to look at PBR examples for a while um, and then try and keep it, um, not, not dump a bunch of new stuff all at once. Um, the graphs, there, there can be some variation in the graphs. That's perfectly fine. Um, you know, it, it, sometimes it can come down to if your graph used, or if, if your calculations used 273 as a conversion factor between C and K, and somebody else used 273.15, that can introduce some, some variations. But like the, the general scales that you see on there, your plot should basically fit in the scales that I've got um, within reason. So if, if your pressure drop is... 0 0.9999, that's probably fine. If your pressure drop is 0 0.6 at the end, and that's completely off of the scale that I've provided, that's something that you might want to look at a little bit more closely. Um, but yeah, some, some variations are, are fine. Yeah, that would be an issue. So your initial molar flow rate should be really close to what I've got. But it, again, it could come down to you know, how many digits of your molar mass did you keep around? Um, I round my molar masses to basically zero digits, right? So 44 or 18 or something like that. Um, so if, the, if there's differences of like 5%, 10% there, that's not the end of the world. If you're getting triple the amount or 10 times the amount that I do, then maybe there's something that's um, worth investigating. Yeah, for the, the heat capacities, your inlet temperature is 500 degrees C, um, which in Kelvin is like 770. And so the, the closest corresponding value in the data tables in the book is about 700 K. So just look up the heat capacities at 700 K and assume that they're constant at those values. Um, there would be no reason that you couldn't use, I don't know, 900 K is a little bit too far away. That, that's a little bit hotter than what we're doing. Um, 700k is a, a pretty good value. If you really wanted to, you could go find polynomial expressions um, and actually evaluate the heat capacities at exactly 500c and assume that they're constant, um, and it, it probably wouldn't change too much. Um, but for this one, 700k uh, is a good temperature to use. Four point five versus three point five. That's a little bit, a little bit more than I would expect it to be.
You're welcome. If you had said like 3.7 instead of 3.5, I'd say, yeah, that's probably pretty close. But 4.5 versus 3.5, I would, I'd stare at it a little bit more and see what you can track down for it. stop recording for any of you watching on the video. We will see you on Friday.